Hello. My name is Tony. G'day. Um, sorry, I just ran down the thing. <laughs> um, yeah, so I live in Brisbane, Australia. Um, I look after the Queensland Functional Programming Lab, a um, team of six people. Our mission is to make functional programming accessible. That's it. So um, <clears throat> let me just get my breath. <laughs> so today we're going to be uh, writing some Haskell. All right. So um, I assume that no one in this room has ever written Haskell. Okay. So and for whom is that true? Most people. Half people. A bit more than half. Cool. Who's, of those who didn't put their hand up, who's written just a little bit? Okay. So that's pretty much everyone. Okay. So um, basically, you know, we've got a few hours together today. Um, I'm going to try and cram as much as I can in those few hours. It'll be a bit painful. I hope that's okay. Um, you know, um, there's no point mucking around. Um, so uh, who is a, a current programmer in, in some other environment? You know, like writes JavaScript or Ruby or Python, whatever it is. So most people are programmers. You know what programming is about. So um, we're going to learn Haskell and functional programming. Um, to help me get an idea what you want to get out of today, it would be really good if some people could tell me what do you want to get out of today? Because there's many directions we can go. Anyone? What would you like to get out of today? Pardon? You just want to learn Haskell. All right, we're going to do that. We're definitely going to do that. Anything else? So I, I've just started working professionally in functional programming in Closure over the past year. Mm -hmm. I don't know much Haskell, but some of my coworkers have been talking in more functional terms. So I like to deal with that. Yep. So more so to, to uh, uh, get the vocabulary a little bit? Yeah. Yep, yeah. okay. Monads. And Monads, all right. So I, th I believe we've got about six hours, all right? And I'm pretty sure that in six hours I can get everyone to learn Haskell, to know what monads are, and to be able to solve some basic problems with Haskell. Does that sound reasonable? Let's do that. All right. Um, before we do, does everyone have this set up? So the source code set up and such that you can you type GHCI. So, uh, if I go back, so I'm in this directory here, FP core. Is that too small, by the way? Is that okay? Yes. Yep. So if I type GHCI in this directory, it compiles 26 modules. Is there anyone for whom that is not true? Okay, what happens? Um. <clears throat> oh, you need to install GHC. Who's got a Mac and has installed GHC? What did you do? Because I don't know how to do it on it. Okay, do you have Homebrew on there? Homebrew. I think that's a no. Uh, is it? So what did you do? Yeah. GHC for Mac. Uh, was it? Was it? Yes, clone the repo. Yeah. If you, if you, they have Nix installed, Oh, uh, yeah. Did you install Haskell Platform? I did. Okay. All right. Do you want to help me out and yeah. sort out the Mac people? So Pedro's going to help me out today. He's volunteered. Good on you, Pedro. <laughs> so can you sort out the Mac people? <laughs> and there was someone else, actually. There were two people. I think it was another Mac user. Yeah. Yeah, you sorted? All right, cool. Well, there's a lot of us using it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, so that's going to take a while for those people. Um, so while that is downloading, you might want to pair up with someone else. Does that, does that sound reasonable? Because that's going to take a while. Um, I need to tell you what functional programming means, at least for today. It only takes me five minutes to tell you what it means, so that's good. Um, I even brought some code that tells me what it means, actually. Or well, maybe I, I can just write it. All right, so everyone's familiar with programming. <coughs> <coughs> uh, 
<clears throat> Here is a program. There's a bit of code there that you don't need to care about. And this program is called P1. And I'm going to take P1 and I'm going to factor out common expressions. Okay, so I'm going to factor them out to a name. I have to come up with a name. That's the hardest part of functional programming. So R So I've turned P1 into P2 and then I ask the question does P1 equal P2? And that is dependent on F. Okay? So if F what could F do? It could print out its argument and then return it. In that case, P1 is not equal to P2. Does everyone agree with that? Yes. Or it could just return its argument, in which case P1 is equal to P2. Okay? So that's dependent on F. Um, it, could, you know, it could take in a list and compute the length and might open up a database connection while it's there. You laugh, but I've seen that code. You've seen that code. <laughs> Sorry, mate? They're, they would be equal unless, so let's write F. So F takes in a list. This is just in a pretend programming language, right? And what it does, there's a counter somewhere. And then it returns the list length, okay? <clears throat> and now they're not equal. They're not equal because the counter got updated twice in this case, and it only got updated once in this case. And so they're two different programs because of the property of F. However, if F were that, so it didn't update the counter, they are now the equal programs. They're the same program. And for two programs to be equal, I mean, given inputs, you get the same, pro the same outputs out. However, it calculates the outputs is not the point. All right, does everyone understand that so far? Okay, functional programming is the property of preserving this property where P1 always equals P2 when I factor out common expressions. All right? That's the definition. Is there anyone for whom that makes no sense? Great. You all now know what functional programming means. This has consequences. So... Who knows how to calculate the length of a list? Everyone. Let's do it. Here's how I did it 20 years ago. You might do it like this. And you go for int i equals zero. i is less than the list length. Oops, fingers. Uh, I haven't written a for loop in a while. Go something like that. Uh, <laughs> something like this. And then return r. That's how you calculate the length of the list. However, this expression violates that property. All right, and in fact, so does this one. Uh, no, sorry, no, it doesn't. Just that one. Uh, this one does. So this is not functional programming. This is dysfunctional programming. We have not preserved the property where if I factor out that expression to a value, it remains the same program. All right, so the goal of today is you used to know how to calculate the length of the list like that. However, you're not allowed to do that. So what do you do next? That's what we're going to do today. Okay? Make sense? All right. <clears throat> I have to teach you Haskell. Haskell takes about 90 minutes to learn with a room this size. I've been doing this for a while now takes about 70 to 90 minutes. It's pretty good. I've taught Java as well. It takes a lot longer. <laughs> so at least one semester. <clears throat> but we can do Haskell. All right. So just put aside, you know, I know I said make sure that's compiling over there. Just put that aside. Open up a blank text file. <clears throat> Save that text file somewhere and give it a .hs file extension. So I'm just going to put mine in my temp directory, call it file.hs, okay? 
better close that. <coughs> All right, everyone's got a blank text file with a .hs extension. I'm going to open up a terminal. I'm going to go to that directory in which I just saved that file. And I'm going to type ghci. And it just says, welcome to ghci. The interpreter for the Glasgow Haskell compiler. And then I'm going to type colon load my source file. It does tab completion. And that compiled. Well done on your first Haskell program. <laughs> we should see if anyone wants to buy it. Yes, the blank file is, is a valid Haskell program. Um, I'll just get to my notes. Hang on. Um, let's let's uh, make it a little bit more interesting. Let's say x equals 99. x equals 99, save the file, come back over to the terminal and type colon reload. And you should see that the file continues to compile. No one's complaining, everyone has x equals 99. Your second Haskell program. It's still not valuable on the street, I think. <clears throat> and you can evaluate that expression, x. So we've assigned x to 99. And as we know, as we have committed to, x will always be 99. It will never be 100. Yeah, mate? Uh, what do you take? Let's try. Let's do it. OK, and we'll save. And we'll reload. And that says, that's not a Haskell program. It says, you've declared x twice. So you're not allowed to do that. OK, so remember, we have committed to the idea that we cannot change values. And the good thing about Haskell is it doesn't allow you to anyway. It's not me who's not going to not disallow you. It's you. It's the compiler. Yep. Yeah, I have an issue here. It says, like, doesn't stop from the integer. Uh, are you in the directory, the FP course directory? For those who are, type ghci ignore, oops, dash ignore dot ghci. So in, in that directory, so as, lo as long as you're in a directory that doesn't have a dot ghci file, yeah, it'll be that. And then uh, it should load. So that, that directory with the clone of the code um, has a .ghci file, which will mess with this a little bit. What if we are at the pre pre prompt? Uh, what if you are? Sorry? Yeah, so I, so I did the same command, and yet yeah, I'm at the pre prompt. It's pre Oh, that's that's my settings. Sorry. Yeah, yours probably looks a little bit different. But as long as it's well, I mean, you can make sure that you're doing things correctly. You can type not a GHCI, a Haskell program, colon reload, and it. Uh, I haven't loaded yet, so load because I, I restarted it. So as long as that says there's an error, go back again, colon reload, and now there's not an error. As long as you can do that. <clears throat> okay. Um, who uses statically typed programming languages mostly? Okay, almost everyone. Haskell is a statically typed programming language. It is type inferred. All right, so that, that is to say some statically typed languages make, force you to write the type of expressions, whereas Haskell, it makes it optional. All right, it can work out the type. It knows that 99 is not a database connection. But today, we're actually going to write the type. X is of type integer. 
And anywhere you see two colons like this in Haskell, you pronounce this as is of type. X is of type integer. We reload, and by the way, you can just type colon R. Colon R to reload, and it continues to compile. <clears throat> All right. We can evaluate it. There's X. It's 99. Let's write a function. One thing you'll learn today is that I am very unimaginative with identifier names. I hope that's okay. I'm terrible at it. So, our function will be called f. We'll take an argument. How about a? And to a, it's going to add, oh, let's, let's uh, add 77. Okay, save, reload. It's still Haskell. That's good. I can ask for the type of f. Actually, don't do that just yet. Let's give it a type. <coughs> Pardon me. So the type of f is given an integer, return an integer. Does everyone agree with that? All right. And in Haskell, we express that like this. Given an integer, return an integer. Reload again, and that's reloading. We can also ask for the type of f. So that's colon type, and that tells us the type. We can actually ask for the type of anything, like the type of 99, or the type of plus 1, etc. We'll, we'll learn how to read those types in a minute, but we can ask for those types. <coughs> so given an integer a, return a plus 77. There is another way to write this expression in Haskell, just a bit more syntax. I'm going to come up with another function name. How about ff? Or maybe g. Should we go with g? We'll go with g. Let's go with g. All right. <clears throat> and on the right side of equals, I'm going to write an, a function, an inline function. It's also called a lambda expression. So if you type lambda expression into a search engine, You'll see all this funny stuff, but all it is, is this. Given A, do A plus 77. Reload, it's still Haskell. <clears throat> Does anyone, everyone know what the lambda symbol is? It's the Greek lambda symbol. This is the closest ASCII approximation of that symbol. <laughs> That's all that is. And some text editors, I'm sure someone in this room has it configured so that it displays the actual lambda symbol. It's a actually, it's this one here. I, ha I have this one. That's the lambda symbol there. <clears throat> so you'll hear a lot of Greek words when you do functional programming. It's just Greek. It's not scary. Lambda is just a letter. So the way we read this is given A, return A plus 77. So that's what G is. I'm going to give G a type, which is the same as the type of F. Reload. It's still Haskell. I can ask for the type of G. That's the type of G. <clears throat> and now I'm going to call G. So I'm going to call G and I'm going to evaluate. So give, I'm going to call G and then I'm going to give it an integer. I need an integer, 10, let's try 10, and I get back 87. All right, so g is a function that, given an integer, applies plus 77 to that integer, returning 87. Any questions so far? Welcome to Haskell. Probably about 20% of the way through. It's not hard. The syntax is not hard. So F is essentially syntactic sugar for G, right? Very, yes, exactly. Oh, th this, this, syn this sort of syntax here is syntactic sugar for that lambda expression. Yep. You can think of them as equivalent. Yep. What if, what if you want to add two numbers? 
Let's add two numbers. All right. How did you know I was going to do that next? Well, I have to come up with a variable name. That's the hard bit. <coughs> hmm? N? That's skipping ahead a little bit, isn't it? <laughs> All right. How about we call one of the integers N? Sound fair? So we'll take in two integers, N and O. And how about let's add them and multiply them by two. We'll reload. It's still Haskell. The type of H is integer to integer to integer. And the way we read this type signature, so H is of type. The problem with English is it doesn't have parentheses. Like we do pauses instead. All right? H is of type integer to integer to integer. The parentheses go there the redundant parentheses. The right arrow associates to the right, okay? So anytime you see that right arrow and you go, where do the parens go? It's to the right. And there are some consequences to that. How many arguments does H take? It takes one argument, that one there, and it returns a function. And that function takes one argument. And in fact, all Haskell functions take one argument. Always. It's never not true. Isn't that good, being consistent? You'll be walking down the street next week, right? And someone will go, how many arguments does a Haskell function take? You'll be like, one. <laughs> Keep walking. You didn't lie. <clears throat> Type of H, integer to integer to integer. Let's give it an integer. How about... 55. What is the type of H given 55? It returns the function integer to integer. I'll give it another integer, 88, and now I have an integer. That ex so that expression, H55, 88, has the type integer. I will now remove that colon T and I'll evaluate that expression, and it's 286. Okay? Everyone happy with that so far? Okay, good. <clears throat> um, ju just a point of note, actually. Um, the type of this is integer to integer. Who uses Java or C Sharp? A few people. And there's a, there's a method there called toString in those languages. Do you know that method? Yes. And what it does is it prints out the, uh, how to display the value, all right? Um, unless it doesn't know how to display it, in which case it prints out the pointer. <clears throat> um, so that's not cool. In Haskell, uh, and by the way, I used to work on the JDK, so I'm as guilty as anyone. So I'm not trying to make you feel bad. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, a function integer to integer doesn't know how to print. Okay, an integer does, but a function does not. Therefore, when we try to, it says that. And this says, I don't know how to show things that have that type. That's a type error. All right? So in those languages, Java and C Sharp, everything knows how to print it, just by virtue of the language said so. The Haskell, it's not true. Integers know how to print out, but not functions integer to integer. All right, I'm going to write another function called i. It's going to take in an argument. I've got to come up with another name. How about k? 
And here's what this function is going to do. It's going to apply k to the value 66. What is the type of i? Yeah, mate. I agree. <clears throat> or you could do the pause thing, right, when you try and say it in English. It's given a function integer to integer in parens. Return an integer. <clears throat> All right. Does everyone agree with that? K is a thing that takes an integer, and I'm just going to force it to return an integer. I could. You are correct. So I am over specializing when I say that. So I is something that takes something integer to integer, and then the whole thing returns an integer. All right? So given a function, return an integer. <clears throat> so I'm going to call k, and I now need to give it a function integer to integer. I have one of those. I have several. f is one of those. Do you agree? So if I call k with f, I'll get back an integer. Uh, i, sorry. Sorry, i. Thank you. It's 143. It took f, which was this, this function here, and passed it in as an argument, which became k, and applied it to 66, which became 143. All right. Is everyone happy with that? I could create a function in line, say, Given an integer, return that. So given an integer, w, apply that, and that seems to work out somehow. All right? Do you want me to make that terminal bigger? No one said yes. This one here. I can make that bigger. No? OK. <clears throat> All right. Yep. So Go for it. K sixty six assumes the operator is a plus. Mm, where's the plus? So K is a function that turns integers into integers. So that's just a Haskell thing. Yeah. Well. It, uh, yes. I'm. I'm not sure where you're coming from. So here's. So this thing here is a thing that turns integers into integers, all right? So given w, return w times that number. I could do plus, all right? It's, it's whatever that function is. Like I could do w plus w, for example. All right, so I'm passing in the function of given an integer, return an integer. I get it now, thank you. You got it? All right, cool. As someone rightly pointed out, k doesn't necessarily return an integer. Does everyone agree with that? There's nothing about this code that says that k must return an integer. It could, in fact, return anything. Oh, sorry, not k, i. Even i, typing Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm narrowing the type by typing that in. So let's be a type inferencer. Like, we will be this algorithm, and we'll try and figure out the type. Um, there's an integer. I applied k to it. I therefore know that that is integer. Does everyone agree? Yeah. k returned anything in that position. And as long as that anything was the same anything as that thing. Does everyone agree with that? It doesn't have to be integer, but as long as those two things are the same. And in Haskell, we use type variables for that, um, also known as generics for the, for the other languages that we're talking about. Um, so we, we can just say, 
anything as long as they are the same thing. And in Haskell, they must start with a lowercase character, type variables. All right? That's a rule. That's not a convention. It's a rule. Isn't that good? So that means I have to come up with a name. Oh, well. As long as it starts with a lowercase, and it's the same in those two positions. All right, so x is a type variable, and that continues to compile. Yep? So in some languages, they usually use a just like convention is not required. Oh, you use a, did you say? Yeah. Yeah, we can use a. Like I said, I'm terrible at variable names. That's fine, as long as it's lowercase and it's the same in both those positions. Um, in some languages, actually, like Java and C Sharp, you've got to do this as well. And Haskell, you can do that as well. But you don't use angle brackets. You do this. If you really want to. Some people prefer to, oh, and actually you can't. <laughs> uh, ignore what I just said. <clears throat> you can, it's just for today you can't. <laughs> I don't want to go into that. <clears throat> All right. So these are type variables. And in fact, I can now use i um, in such a way that I pass in a function that goes integer to something else. Um, so I'm going to call i, given an integer, such as n. And what can we do with it? We can put it in a list of two elements. All right. So that is, given an integer, construct the list that has that integer twice. And if I call it, it applied that function to 66. Yeah? Any questions at this point? Um, another thing, actually, I should have pointed out. So before I said, you know, call h with 55 returns function integer integer. I can call it again with another integer. And now I've got an integer. Um, function application, which is this space that I'm using here, this is different to the arrow, right? Which is function implication, but function application is left associative. Okay. So the parens go to the left for space. Arrow to the right and space to the left. Yep. Uh, the C in the square bracket, is it a tuple or a list? It's a list. Square brackets in Haskell is a list. But we're not going to use that today. We're going to actually write our own list. <clears throat> OK. So that's I. Let me have a look at my notes. What else do we have to do? Functions take one argument, lambda expressions, operators. Let's do some operators. All right. I'm going to call h again with 55 and 88, and I get 286. h starts with a letter that is between a and z. It starts with an alpha character. That means it's in prefix position. That is to say, its name followed by its arguments. I can move it over into infix position by surrounding it in backticks. Because it starts with the letter A to Z. All right, so because it starts with A to Z, it's in prefix position by default. How can I move it to infix position with backticks? Can you define it? Can I which? Can you define it in Yes. Yes. I can, but that means I have to come up with another name. One that doesn't start with A to Z. Like, how about dot plus dot? And I'm just going to copy and paste. Copy, paste, and that goes dot plus dot. All right, so this is the same function, but its name has changed. Reload. So in this case, the function does not start with A to Z. And therefore, it doesn't need anything around it when it's in infix position. I mean, you've all done that before in your programming language, right? 
You've used functions in infix position. Plus is in infix position in most languages, in C and Java. It's just that Haskell doesn't give it special treatment. If I want to move it over into, so there it is in infix position, I can move it over to prefix position by surrounding it in parentheses. Okay? Just a bit of syntax. You don't have to memorize it. If you forget, it's over in the readme. If it starts with A to Z, it's in infix posi uh, prefix position by default, infix position with backticks. Otherwise, it's in infix position by default and prefix position with parentheses. It's just a Haskell rule. And it's written over here. There you go. If you forget that rule, it's in the readme. <clears throat> All right. What's that? We're about at nearly halfway. Cool. <clears throat> Any questions? Congrats. You know, you're nearly half of Haskell. <clears throat> okay. Type variables, as we know, start with a lowercase character, such as A. Data types start with an uppercase character, such as integer. I'm going to write another function just to emphasize type variables. I'll call it J, you know, because that's next. And it does that. What is a type of J? Hmm? A, a to A. Something to something as long as the two somethings are the same. Or GHC decided to call it P. Thanks, I didn't have to come up with a name. All right. So that's polymorphic. J is polymorphic. It takes in, it can take in a string. It can take in an integer. It can take in itself. But that's going to return a function, which is not going to show. So then I have to give it an argument, etc. OK? So, let me just check again where we're up to. All right, that's functions in Haskell. That's pretty much the syntax for functions in Haskell. The next thing we have to look at is data types. So in terms of the general workflow of what it is that we do in Haskell is we tend to write data types and then functions over the data types. Like for example, we might write a list and we might, we might write the function add up all the integers in the list. And this is, this is the general pattern. So let's create a data type. Data type is created with a keyword data. Um, I'm going to create one called shape. <clears throat> and this is where our analogies to existing programming languages start to break down a little bit. Um, so if you've used languages like Java or C-sharp, we have an interface, and then you have an open world of the number of instances. Um, we don't have an open world here. We have a closed world. I've got to list my shapes, and there's going to be a finite number of them. So I'm going to have a rectangle. All right, so the, 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 uh, the syntax here is use the data keyword followed by the data type name, which must start with a capital letter equal sign, oh, actually type variables, but we don't have any at this, in this case, equal sign, and then the list of constructors, data constructors they're called. So I'm going to have three constructors, three different ways of making a shape. Um, actually, most people write all that on one line. So I'm going to say rectangle, whoops, that has a width and a height. Constructors are separated by the pipe symbol. Square, that's another constructor, 
which just has one side length and a circle, which has a radius. And in this universe, all circles have integer radius. There is no floating point in this universe. Consequently, pi equals 3. Well, it has to. <clears throat> All right, so we have a data type. We'll just check that it compiles. It compiles. If I ask for the type of rectangle, all right, the type of rectangle is given an integer and then an integer return a shape. It constructs a shape. All right, so given a width such as 22 and a height such as 44, I now have a shape. I have constructed a thing of that type. Does that make sense? Um, again, if you use languages like Java and C Sharp, constructors must have the same name as the data type. That's one of the language rules. Hassle doesn't have that rule. They might be the same name, but they don't have to be. All right, what's going to happen when I print this out? It's going to print out the pointer address. No. Just kidding. It's going to say, I don't know how to print these. How do you show a shape? And there's two ways I can respond to this. I can actually write it all out, how to print out a shape. Or I can get the compiler to generate. Oh, one thing I just remembered. Make sure you've got tabs turned off in your text editor. Yeah. You know the tabs and spaces debate? Some people forget there's a third position. So there's tabs, spaces, and Haskell. <laughs> all right. So it's not a debate. Turn them off. They've got to be off. Because um, I just realized when I started indenting here. Um, alternatively, you can use semicolons, but no one does that. Uh, so basically, I'm going to ask the compiler to write out the show instance for shape. And I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to what show instance actually means. But I can do that using the deriving keyword. And this says to the compiler, can you please figure out how to show one of these yourself? And the compiler says, yes, I can. Now when I print it out, it used that default instance, or the derived instance, I should say. So deriving is a keyword. <coughs> Similarly, if I compare two shapes for equality, in Java that's going to print false, if I remember rightly. Something about pointer addresses being not the same or something. In Haskell, it's going to say, what are you talking about? I don't know how to compare two shapes for equality. Oh, sorry, Haskell. Can you please generate the default instance? And Haskell says, why, yes, I can. And now that's true. So it does a deep equality. It goes down all the constructors of the data types, comparing them for equality. All right, so there are only three ways to construct a shape. It's not an open world. Exactly three. Any questions? What do we do with these data types? Let's do a thing. <clears throat> well, we can construct them, you know, like that, like that. We are building shapes when we do this. That's not very interesting. Let us calculate the perimeter of a shape. So the perimeter takes a shape and returns, come on fingers, an integer. Does everyone agree that's going to be the perimeter of a shape? <clears throat> and we, what we want to do now is do case analysis on that shape. We want to say, is it a rectangle? And if it is, get its width and height, add them and multiply by two. Say again? Circle, it's 
The radius of a circle is not an integer. But, but you have circle, so you have to calculate the length of highest three. Highest three. Uh, yeah, it's true that I'm going to calculate the perimeter of the circle. I'm not sure what you're saying. It's if, not an integer. If it's not, it is in my universe. <laughs> because pi is 3. Are you cool with that? <laughs> so you get a circle with radius 2, and suddenly the next circle is a radius 3. There are no circles in between. All right, any other questions? I'm glad that that was the only question. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to do case analysis on, on my shape. I'm going to say, is it a rectangle? Is it a square or is it a circle? There are a few different ways of writing it. I'm going to write it out the long way first. So the first thing I have to do is, well, um, let's do a lambda. That's the very first thing you could do. And I'm now going to have to say, given a shape, that means I have to come up with a name. I hate that bit. Lambda S for shape. And now I want to say, case it into its three cases. We use the case of keyword for that. The two keywords. And I tend to line that up there. Rectangle. We'll do rectangle first. Rectangle carries two integers. So that means I have to come up with two names, the width and the height. Oops. And now I need the return value. All right, so I've said, is the shape a rectangle? If it is, name its width W, name its height H. And now let's return width plus height times 2. <clears throat> Alternatively, if it's a square, which has a side X, its perimeter is X times 4. And circles with a radius of R have a perimeter of r times 2 times pi. <coughs> Reload, and it's still Haskell. <clears throat> so, I can now calculate the perimeter of Let's construct a rectangle. A rectangle of sides 77 and 88 has a perimeter of 330. I could pass it into G. So don't forget G. G is an integer to integer. Let's pass the integer into G. Now it's 407. I forget what G did. Probably added something. Added 77, I'd say. Um, yep. Yep. Oops. All right. Uh, let's just have a look at this. Uh, not that. How about that? <clears throat> so why are these parentheses required? And the answer is space is left associative. Okay, without those parentheses, it becomes this. Oh. All right, and we don't want that. We don't want to say, take perimeter and pass in rectangle, which will give us back a function. Well, actually, we won't type check. All right, so we, we need those in there. Uh, that one there. To group those, and we're saying apply rectangle to 77, then to 88, group those, and then apply perimeter to that. Um, it doesn't have to be a rectangle. A circle with radius 99 has a perimeter of 594. Yeah. Does Haskell have um, something like a pipe operator so we can get rid of the parentheses? A, a pi operator? Pipe. A oh, pipe. Yes, it does. Yes. Um, I tend not to use it in this environment. 
Um, but just to answer your question, it's called dollar. You can do that. Um, but you're on your own if you do that. <laughs> so I don't intend to use that today. You can look it up. Here's its type. Given a function a to b, return a function a to b. Um, and that, that's, yeah. <clears throat> All right, primitives. Primitive of a circle radius 99 is that. OK. So we've done that using case analysis, also known as pattern matching. OK, so that's pattern matching. I'll do it again using uh, more syntax, or different syntax, I should say. I'll have to come up with another name. How about that? I can actually write it like this. This is the sa exactly the same function. The only difference is syntax. Square x is x times 4. Circle radius r is r times 2 times pi. Whoops. Nope. That. Uh, what is the problem? Oh, yeah. So th these are both the same function. The only difference is syntax. In fact, this one compiles into this one. The benefit of this one is it's an inline function. It does case analysis inline. The other one is you've got to come up with a name. Because I, I didn't have to come up with a name here, right? I can just copy and paste this straight into the, into the interpreter. And it'll just be a function. And no name was having, I didn't have to name it perimeter. The best variable length name is zero length, in my opinion. Yeah. Oh, you don't have the type. That's true. Sorry, I should have written that. Well, I mean, ah. for example, we only have rectangle, but we don't have square and circle. Oh, what if we did that? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, okay, let's try it. Um, it still compiles. So it's let's try and call it with a rectangle. That works. But here's, here's the real question, right? Now what? What do you think? Have a guess. A compile error? It's already compiling. It reloaded, right? Gives me a runtime error. We have non-exhaustive patterns. Is it possible to compiler to force the exhaustive uh, cases? Is it possible to ensure exhaustive patterns the answer is no. That's equivalent to solving the holding problem. So no. However, you can turn on warnings. And I've forgotten the name of it. I think it's warn incomplete patterns. Let me check real quick. Uh, like for the data types, we define data types ourselves. <coughs> Pardon? I mean like this. This warning uh, will work for the data types only, right? If you define your data type as like rectangle, square, and circle, and it only provides rectangle, it will say you're missing square and circle. Uh, the warning will, yeah. Is it possible to say compiler error instead of compiler warning? N not in the general case, no. But even specifically for this case? This case is going to warn, yeah. So you can't do it in the general case. In a, in a Turing complete language, anyway. But if I want to compile to fail, is it possible to say it's, it's an error, not a warning? Oh, you can make warnings turn into errors, yes. Um, minus W warnings as errors, or there's some flag, but yes. So I, my colleagues at home insist that warnings are errors. That's one of their rules that when we write code. There's pretty much our only rule, actually. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's warnings as errors or something. Um, there it is there, actually. Make any warning into an error. So we can do that. But errors aren't on by default? No. So that failed. Uh, the re I mean, there's, there's, there's hundreds of them. Yeah. Yeah, so. Um, 
Now, that's, the, the warning here is patent matches are non-exhaustive. They're non-exhaustive because it doesn't cover every case. And that just makes it go away. All right. Yep. Without the lambda, the first perimeter doesn't compile because it doesn't know pi is. Could we turn pi into the data type and then it would compile? Without the lambda. Without the lambda perimeter. That one. So it doesn't know what pi is in circle. So if, if I delete all of that. If you just delete lambda s arrow. That won't compile because it doesn't know what s is. Yeah, pi is here. So, what, what's the error that you're getting? Not, not found pi. If I if I remove that, it'll say what's s. Oh, pardon me. What's s? I could do that. Yep. That'll work. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yep. So those two representations for pattern matching, or I should say, the one pattern matching, the other one, I guess, Oh, they're, they're both pattern matching. Oh, you both call them? Yeah. In this particular circumstance, it's this one. Okay. All right. The reason you would use this one is if you had to come up with that pattern match program in line. All right. So, if imagine you had a function that took a function as an argument shaped to integer, All right? And you need to just construct in line a function shaped to integer. And you're like, I don't have to want to come up with another name. So you just said lambda shape, case of, and now you're done. And you didn't have to come up with the name perimeter. But because I've already come up with the name, then that is more canonical. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Any other questions? I'm going to do this again, just to reinforce it. I'm going to write another data type. So shape had three constructors. <clears throat> I'm going to write another one called one or two. And the thing about this data type is it's going to be parameterized on a type variable. All right. So again, if, you use, if you've ever seen generics, it's very similar to this. So it has either one A or two A's. That's Haskell. We'll derive equality and show. It's still Haskell. <clears throat> 